Welcome to the Michael Eric Dyson Show. Today I'll discuss HIV slash AIDS awareness with award-winning actress and my dear friend, Regina King. Later on, we'll have a little summer fun. Hot fun in the summertime. And talk about roller coasters with David Altman, vice president of the American Coaster Enthusiasts. And I'll have a discussion, interesting as it is, with Dr. Iona Vargas from the Family Reunion Institute at Temple University. But first, community cancer care in our country is in crisis mode. That's more than an alliteration. That is an iteration of the difficulty and crisis we confront. Eighty-four percent of our country's cancer patients receive medical care in community settings, but a large percentage of those centers are closing or struggling financially. Ted Ocon, executive director of the Community Oncology Alliance, is with us today to share more details of this urgent problem. Mr. Ocon, thanks for coming on to the Michael Eric Dyson Show. Dr. Dyson, thank you for having me on. Um, look, give us an idea of the exact nature of the community cancer centers. Uh, how many are there? Uh, where are they? And, and what kinds of patients do they actually serve? Sure. Let me give you just a little bit without boring uh, you or your audience about a little history here. Uh, over the last 25 years, um, uh, cancer care in this country has evolved dramatically. Uh, 25 years ago, if you had cancer, you basically had to travel sometimes two, 300 miles. You had to go to a major medical center to receive cancer care, and you were treated as an inpatient, meaning you were admitted to the hospital. And because of a number of factors, including the advancers in, in cancer therapy, um, now when you have cancer, you're typically treated in your own community because throughout the country we have not only the most accessible cancer care, we have the best cancer care in the world, and that's actually measured by survival rates. And so the beauty of it is we've evolved the system from a situation of where only people who could really afford to get care and travel uh, to a system where now you're treated in your own community and it's still expensive, but the bottom line is it's very, very accessible. And as I said, we have the best cancer care in the world. Now, what's interesting, before we get onto some of the issues about uh, community centers, when we hear these, uh, are these isolated stories of people who travel to, you know, out of the country because of some new therapy that's either unregulated or not been yet uh, thoroughly tested or vetted, is that the case that uh, those new alternative uh, procedures, practices, are something that we wouldn't integrate into our system here because they're just not known in terms of their effects? No, the, the interesting thing is actually in, in, in the world of cancer care, uh, so many of the treatment and the therapies and the drugs are actually done under a clinical trial. And so people in this country have access to the latest and the greatest and the best, although unfortunately we're seeing signs um, that that may well that may well change. Right. Well, in this country, Medicare and Medicaid have afforded people some access to this extraordinary advantage of being in the cancer, the leading uh, center for cancer care, or at least research. How, how does Medicare, the cuts in Medicare and Medicaid, impact potentially all of those folk who uh, may not have access as they should? Yeah, the problem, let's start with Medicare. So Medicare covers basically individuals who are 65 and older, and there is a small population of people who are uh, disabled who are covered under Medicare. Uh, because cancer is a disease that normally impacts, it impacts everyone, including children and young adults, and unfortunately in the younger population we see more an increasing incidence of cancer. But in those who are 65 and older, it's a population that typically is um, a later disease. And as a result of that, uh, Medicare treats, covers about 50% of the cancer care in this country. So they have sort of a huge influence on what the private payers, uh, private insurance uh, pays, which pays roughly the rest. Roughly about uh, somewhere in the order of 8% or 9% is covered Medicaid. And of course, Medicaid is coverage for those individuals who can't afford it uh, coverage, But the problem with Medicaid that we're seeing is that as we've gone through this recession and the states are crippled, the states are cutting their Medicaid programs and they're cutting their payments not only to providers, but I just saw something the other day in one of the states was actually 
looking at cutting actual oral cancer drugs out of the therapy list that Medicaid patients could receive. And that's really dangerous because then we get into two-tier medicine in this country in terms of what people who can afford and have versus people who cannot afford and don't have. Well, that's certainly the perception, right? And if you're just joining us, we're talking to Ted Ocon, Executive Director of the Community Oncology Alliance. But it, that is the perception that, you know, people with big pockets can obviously afford this. People with the better insurances can afford early detection, which leads to uh, the more successful resolution of this disease, uh, you know, or the five-year survival rate, which indicates that, okay, you're on the right road there, versus people who find it much later and who use emergency wards as, you know, uh, intervention. So how do we how do we write that balance so that more people who are poorer uh, have better access. Well, the the problem is we're going in the we're, we're going in the reverse direction, um, and we're going in the reverse direction because Medicare has been making a series of cuts to cancer care on the provider side, and again they they are the proverbial 800 pound gorilla in the room, and they are making those cuts to Medicare, and that is having a devastating effect. We've actually been tracking now 856 clinics that have been impacted, and that includes uh, 172 clinics that have actually closed. And I'll give you one example. On, I believe it was April 12th, the clinic which has served the community in Selma, Selma, Alabama, for 25 years, basically had to close its door. And, and so the problem is with the Medicare cuts, we have seen the impact on this sort of consolidation, closures, um, a lot of practices that are in financial trouble, and, and that's compounded at the state level with Medicaid. So as a result of that, when you have a clinic, for example, out in Wyoming that has to close, and a patient has to now travel over the border to Billings, Montana, this is an actual case, and decides not to get cancer care, at some point in time, they will end up in the hospital. It's not fair to the patient and by the time they end up in the hospital, basically, they are probably well along and advanced. But we talk about wanting to save money. That person will cost the system more money at the end of life. So it, it, we, we really are not thinking right about this issue. Right. So prevention, an ounce of prevention would be uh, literally worth uh, a pound of cure there. And not to, to, to speak of the fact that a person needlessly loses life. Uh, as well. Well, what happens? You said 172 centers around the country have been uh, have been uh, cl closed. So, what do people do as an alternative when these centers close? What, what the heck do they do? Well, if they're in an area there where where there are other clinics, obviously they have an, another resort. But when you take the example of the clinic that is a facility associated with a practice in Billings, Montana, and they're at Wyoming, and that facility is closed, along with another facility is closed. People have to travel. And I spoke to a, a physician who basically said that he was talking to an individual, and the person said, look, I cannot travel 120 miles on a regular basis to get my care. And that just means I won't get care. So it's a terrible situation. And, and the, the problem is that it's compounded by the fact that half of the oncologists are over the age of 50. Mm. So that there have been, a, there's been a published study that has looked that by the time 2020 rolls around, with the increasing need for cancer care and the decreasing population of physicians to treat cancer care, one in every four cancer patients is going to be short an oncologist. And so it's really distressing. I think those figures are going to be a little worse because I know a lot of oncologists around the country who are saying, I give up. I got into to be a physician. I didn't get into this to have every judgment that I make questioned by an insurance company, and that's what's happening. Virtually everything in some areas that an oncologist will decide to do, an insurance company will say it has to be checked with them first. It's a very inefficient process, and it's really um, you know, causing a dismantling of our cancer care in this country. Well, what about the unwieldy bureaucracy that – to which they make uh, implicit reference there. But what happens um, when, you know, national health care, whatever version manages to be implemented in this country, is that going to have a significant impact uh, upon who gets what kind of care and when? Because it seems that uh, one of the purposes of having a national health care was to provide opportunity for those who were locked out. 
and who weren't able to get the, the requisite kind of uh, care to, to provide a, a modicum of help for them. Does that make a difference in terms of the, uh, what we've seen with this new legislation? Well, I, 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 think it, I think it does because it's very interesting. If you look at over in the U.K., the U.K. is sort of the example of, with the national health system of universal care. And if you look at it stunning last week, the U.K. is coming out with a total fundamental overhaul of their system. They're actually going to take the empowered bureaucracy and they're going to place it back in the hands of the physician. They're going to give primary care physicians sort of that gatekeeper role because the system is not working. And proof positive on the cancer area, if you look at cancer survival in the, in the U.K. up against the rest of Europe or the United States, it's dismal. So the, the problem here is instead of attacking the problem and saying, let's go after those individuals who can't get care, do not get care, let's take care of them, we're trying to redo the entire system, and it's going to have an adverse effect on more people. That's part of the problem. Well, finally, um, what, what's going on here? Is it the White House? Is it Congress? Uh, why can't we uh, make a more concerted effort to save these centers? Because it seems that this is a very important uh, element of our health care landscape. Public policy, Dr. Dyson, sort of it never reaches the middle point and it goes from one extreme to another. Um, there were some changes that need to be made in the reimbursement and the payment for cancer care, which were made back in 2003. Yeah. But unfortunately, the pendulum has swung all the way out, and a lot of times the government, uh, both the White House and Congress, don't act until they see the problem. The problem now is this is a problem that you can't stimulate yourself out of. This is a problem that is um, going to be very fundamental to fix. That's uh, the voice of Ted O'Conn, Executive Director of the Community Oncology Alliance. I know you sit at home saying, what does that guy look like? I guess a more handsome Adam Sandler meets James Conn. You know, uh, we thank you so much for coming on to the show uh, with us here today, and thanks for enlightening us as well. Thank you, Dr. Dyson. Up next, we'll talk about a summer in family favorite, roller coasters. This is the Michael Eric Dyson Show.